methodology for presenting where I create the lecture, the written part of it, I, I pre record that, and then I start laying tracks in Final Cut Pro of every possible video uh, resource material uh, that I have and uh, create the video in sync with the talk, with my recorded talk. The hope is that as I stand here reading my text, I will stay synchronized with my video. Uh, it's all rather exquisitely timed. So if you see me like using my extreme peripheral vision to check to see where the video is, um, it's this duet that I have with my own video. So, um, and um, is it Eden is uh, at the controls. So once she presses go, and I see the title, I'm just gonna go. And it, it, as I say, it, it moves forward for about 40 minutes. And then I'll take a deep breath and allow you to digest and then to formulate some of your own questions. Okay, I think we're ready to go. Yes, it's a pleasure to be here today to be invited to share with you some thoughts about my work and a creative practice that freely moves between many art forms. Having turned 70 this past summer, I feel very fortunate to have had a 50 year career as dancer choreographer and to still be moving. I've learned to diversify my old dates, partly to ward off the slings and arrows of aging and to maintain an active creative practice, but more so to reap the pleasures of making things and if I'm lucky of having them seen by diverse audiences. With my visual aids on video running in sync with my talk, I'll be navigating a look back at my journey from music to dance, to writing, to video, and finally to painting, with movement and dance remaining the common denominator or intersection. My work with Heather Rao at the CTAC School of Ballet has brought me back into the dance studio to make a dance for the first time since I retired from my professorship at the University of Michigan three years ago. It's also been a coming out of sorts after a long spell in isolation during the pandemic. So I consider myself at an intersection of post-retirement and the post-pandemic world. And if I take a few steps back to grasp the larger picture, I also trace a more complex network of intersections, all emerging from or crossing in the action of the dancing body. So in true academic fashion, I've placed these threads of intersections here on the screen with bullet points in hopes you'll follow me into this maze of interconnectivity. So dancing at the intersection, first of all, of the figure in the landscape, uh, we have a, a figure of a video of a person in a video on a screen. We have a figure in a landscape of a painting, of a film, et cetera. So uh, this becomes a metaphor for humans in relationship to their worlds. We have dancing at the intersection of the learned or composed and the improvisational. I'm going to be talking a lot about improvisation. Uh, I know jazz uh, musicians will often improvise on set themes and riff off each other. Well, in a very similar way, I use improvisation to generate movement that to then transmit to other dancers. We're going to be talking about the intersection of the narrative and the abstract, uh, a theme that runs through 20th century art into the 21st. It's this idea of, of the body both being a storyteller, where you read my gestures to understand meaning, but also the creator of abstract line, shape, and sculptures in time and space. Dance at the intersection of all of the arts. Dance has, since tribal times, been a catalyst to bring together costume, lighting, whether that's the lighting of the fire, uh, and music, set design. Uh, so again, of uh, this uh, German word we teach, our students, Gesamtskunstwerk, which is uh, all day, all arts, uh, the world arts work, joining all disciplines. The intersection of the live and the digital, talking a lot about something that has happened during the pandemic in particular, where dancers have to go online. And what does that mean to the moving body on the screen? Uh, dancing at the intersection of the digital universe, as I said, of dancing bodies on screens proliferating on social media, 
and as a means of forging and affirming identity, making communication and building communities of like-minded souls, like makers of screen dances. I'll talk to you about that hybrid art form in a second. But, and then it's also dancing at the intersection of a culture emerging from the pandemic, hovering between online learning communities and information gathering and the return to the live world, albeit transformed. So uh, we'll be talking about all of these ideas of the, of the human body, of the moving body, becoming an intersection. It certainly has become a, a prime subject for academic studies, theoretical studies, is that the body is a text that can be read uh, for anything in its culture. Uh, I want to explain why I'm here before I get any further. I have a lifelong love of a little Traverse Bay. My parents met at the Bayview Summer College just after World War II. And when they married, settled in Detroit and had four hyperactive boys in five and a half years, they desperately needed a summer escape route north. They chose Bayview. I spent my first 16 summers running barefoot over the dunes and through a then rather scruffy, pre-gentrified Bayview. My first dance lessons were at the Bayview Recreation Club, AKA The Rack, with Jimmy Pagonis, who taught us simple ballroom dance steps. As a fledgling violinist, I studied with Bayview Music Program's beloved Viennese virtuoso, Hugo Gottesman while also becoming lead singer in a rock band formed with my buddies. Among them, Tom Gaddle of the Gaddle's Linens and Bo Morley, who started a dental practice in Indian River and is now retired at Harbor Springs. During the summer of 66, we would play Friday nights at the pizza cellar in the basement of the old Chippewa Hotel, built in 1885 and formerly named the Hotel Banghart, on Potosky and Bay Streets. During the winter, my dad would drive us boys up to ski at Nub's Knob, and we'd all pile into one small room at the Chippewa and unroll our sleeping bags on the floor. One night, a drunk staggered into our room, excused himself, and stumbled out. During my middle school years, I began attending Interlochen's National Music Camp, which led to my attending the Winter Arts Academy for high school. For the last 20 years, I've returned to Bayview for my own off-season retreats to attend family reunions. It was on one of these trips that I learned of the dance studio in Crooked Tree and wandered in out of curiosity to introduce myself. I met Heather Rao at that time. We would touch base whenever I came north, and I became very impressed with her vision, determination, and the quality of her students. She moved into the larger studio on Mitchell, and occasionally she would allow me to use the space to stretch myself a ballet bar. I also sent her some of my screen dances or videos of dance filmed and edited especially for the screen. I'd become, I'd been teaching this rapidly developing hybrid form of dance film at the University of Michigan for 20 years. And one, one, one of Heather's very talented students, Haley Van Patten, expressed an interest in making her own videos. I offered to mentor her. Last fall, Heather found she could not stage her annual Nutcracker due to the pandemic. And we quickly began to scheme an online production taking advantage of the local settings and using green screen technology. As is typical with Heather, she mobilized her dancers and collaborators and with grit and ingenuity managed to pull it off wonderfully. This past July, I shared with Heather my idea to transpose onto her dancers a set of dances I improvised and filmed myself to J.S. Bach's extraordinary solo piano work, the Goldberg Variations. We chose seven of the variations that could be learned by 14 young dancers at the CTA School of Ballet. We cast the work and, and I made separate video files of each role or part to send to the dancers. When I arrived to the new studio on August 31st of this year, I witnessed for the first time what they had been able to learn from my video. I have found during my long career teaching young people that they think nothing now of picking up movement off videos on their iPhones or laptops. During our five days together in September, we defined and refined each role then assembled the parts into quartets, duets, solos, and larger ensemble sections. 
This weekend's performance in Harbor Springs will feature the world premiere of the Goldberg Suite, along with dances and videos created by the young dancers and curated by Heather and myself. I'll share with you more about our dance to Bach, but now I would like to give you a bit of the backstory and talk about my life in the arts, more specifically about my interdisciplinary practice of moving freely between art forms of music, dance, video, writing, and painting. I do this not so much to celebrate myself, but to preach the gospel of interdisciplinarity, whether in the making of art or in any activity performed in work or play. My evolving theory or belief or hope is that we all have the capacity to develop transferable skills and make a creative practice out of anything and everything we do, which in turn allows us insights, pleasure, and appreciation for the wonders of our complex worlds and unites us despite our differences. As a kid growing up in a middle-class family in Northwest Detroit in the 50s and early 60s, I loved attending the DIA. My favorite paintings there were Franz Hals's The Laughing Boy, Van Gogh's Self-Portrait, of course, and Bougereau's Hazelnuts. In my public elementary school, I painted an art class and was assigned the task of creating displays in the hallway display cases. Once I began playing the violin at age nine, music took over all my spare moments with practicing lessons, orchestra, string quartet, and summer music camp at Interlochen. It was while a high school student and very serious violinist in the orchestra at Interlochen Arts Academy that I took an introduction to dance class as an alternative to the state-required phys ed. By my senior year, I had changed my major to dance and was performing on stage before I really knew what I was doing. I just followed the cues in the music while discovering how my body could be a paintbrush, a moving sculpture, an instrument, a drawing tool, and an architectural feature in a choreographic design that unfurled in time and space. My professional dance career began my third year at the Juilliard School, touring the world with the Jose Limon Dance Company. There's Jose with his hand on the bar. I began drawing while traveling or while hitchhiking through Europe during summer breaks. I would create self-portraits, quick sketches of people on the street, waiting in train stations, the interior of a small attic flat in Paris. I wandered through countless museums, saw paintings I viewed in art books as a child and as a teenager. I was introduced to a higher form of collaboration and fusion of dance and visual arts when I joined Martha Graham's dance company in 1973. Since Graham had been making dances in the late 1930s, she had been drawn to artists and composers for ins inspiration to assist her in bringing her intense, dramatic, and stylized vision to the stage. She worked with Alexander Calder while rehearsing her all-women's company at Bennington College in the late 1930s, and beginning in 1940 with the great Japanese-American sculptor Isamo Noguchi. Noguchi's sparse sets, exquisite modernist props, and Jungian landscapes elevated Graham's work to a level of mid-century modern abstraction, while allowing for Graham to tell her emotionally charged stories, often based on historical figures or mythological legends. Graham's movement soon took on a razor-sharp edge to emulate the sculptural aspects of the Noguchi sets. And generations of Graham dancers were groomed through studying the Graham technique to activate the space and project the contours of our bodies with pulsing accents derived from the pelvis and the thrust of the torso as it spiraled around the spine and cut indelible shapes in space. Graham taught us how to place those shapes into a flow or sequence and intelligently connect them or knit them together with transition and movement. The jagged, irregular rhythms of these phrases and the visceral torque of the body created a look that was both archaic and contemporary, not unlike the brush strokes of an early Jackson Pollock, Franz Klein, Kandinsky, Picasso, or the music of her early mentor, Louis Horst, or later of Aaron Copeland, William Schumann, Samuel Barber, Giancarlo Manati, and Igor Stravinsky. 
I quickly picked up on Graham's legacy by making my own dances for my own fledgling dance company and working with composers, actors, and visual artists. Dance was my passport to the world's museums and galleries as I toured both as a member of Graham's company and as an independent artist through all of Russia, Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and the US. After 12 years on the road, I finally settled in a small campus town in Michigan to take a steady job as a tenure track professor in the Department of Dance at University of Michigan. I wasn't too far from my childhood home in Detroit, the museum that started it all for me. My first collaboration as a faculty member was with an architect and a composer. I later worked closely with painters, scientists, and poets, and wrote my own poems and texts, while continuing to commission costumes, sets, and musical scores. I championed interdisciplinarity on campus with a group of adventurous faculty and spent 34 years move, moving freely between the art forms and the departments on campus. These are some shots of the pieces I did with painter Jim Coxwell, uh, archi the architectural faculty and composers. Uh, I learned video editing, began to perform and edit my own screen dances, and for 19 years taught students the art of screen dance or dance for the camera with a colleague from the film department. I became unofficial resident artist of the U university's Life Sciences Institute and collaborated with a cell biologist on an interdisciplinary performance staged in the rotunda of the U of M Museum of Natural History. Seven years ago, I discovered painting with acrylics and converted my office at the Life Sciences Institute into my painting studio, rather subversively, actually. Three years ago, I retired in order to devote all my time to painting and creative projects. My husband, John, has, had converted our one-car garage into his printmaking studio decades ago. The summer I retired, I built for myself a studio in our upper backyard, and I now have a room of my own to paint, do my daily movement workout, to edit and shoot video, and to write and ruminate. I enjoy spending hours lost in making art and occasionally inviting friends and fellow artists over to compare notes and get feedback. As a dancer for 50 years, I've etched, stretched, honed, feathered, edged, shaped, tapered, lathed, contoured, distorted, contorted, and sculpted every centimeter of my flesh and bone into outrageous acts of movement performance. It eventually came to me to pick up a brush and to translate that body knowledge via the stroke of that brush to experience how that stroke issues from the same impulses that guide my dancing body and how color, the application of acrylic paint as evidence of a physical gesture onto a receptive but neutral space of the canvas can leave behind a visceral and visual impression that strikes the viewer as real or having actually happened, producing that shock of recognition. I had already been able to extend my dancing career as a video artist, filming myself and editing countless works for the screen in which I perform feats via editing magic that I could never replicate on stage. I know how to regard my body in the third person as a form to manipulate from a distance once removed as other, as that guy, as him. What is there left to capture in the moving body once it has been documented in a photograph or video? Film, photography, video have radically shaped the way we understand our histories, current events, how we define reality, realism, or realness, and how we remember and record our lives. But what cannot be revealed by these media? With my early attempts at figurative works, I propose that the photo is merely a portal, an invitation or contour map for further excavations and reenactments. Acrylic paint and the stroke of the brush allow me to reanimate the photograph or filmed figure as I return to it my own body memories and sensations and invest in the painted image, its lived kinesthetic presence. In order to produce my source image for the camera, I feel movement from the inside of my body and perform for the outside eye of the camera. As I do so, I imagine frame by frame what I might look like at that instant and how it might translate onto canvas as a painting. I then curate from among those recorded moments, whether captured on iPhone, 
conventional camera or digital video, a still image of my body that strikes me as visually and viscerally provocative. I regard that image as something outside of me as both subject and object. I project it with video projector directly onto the canvas and draw its outlines. I'm then ready to re-enter the image and re-experience the original moment of intention and muscular tension from the inside of my body as I paint it. As soon as my brush touches canvas, I enter into an immersive trance-like state. Time stretches, collapses, and disappears. I am everywhere at once between the eye, the hand, and the end of the brush, between the colors I mix as I go, between the sensations under or on the surface of my skin and their visual manifestation on canvas. I slip into the zone. I catch sight of myself. A kind of truth comes full circle. Seeing and doing are one. It is a transference of kinesthetic empathy, stroke by stroke. It is just like dancing, except that the product is a material object made of inert matter, hung on a wall, pre-staged, or already performed within the frame of the camera and canvas. It only finds its audience after the fact, in the eye of the beholder. As a result of this particular intersection or convergence of media, Many of my works for video combine performance for the camera, video editing, and painting. Movement shot against green screen is cloned and choreographed in editing via chroma key effect into a video of bodies floating in a black void. That video is projected onto blank white canvas. Cho choosing hinge moments in the action, I pause the video in order to paint in a landscape around the figure then photograph that canvas without those projected figures before forwarding to the next hinge in action I hope you're following. While the paint is still wet, I augment the painting to shift the scene ahead in time and place, accumulating a series of stills of an ever warping canvas until the closing scene. I drop the completed series into my Final Cut Pro editing file and place the still photos behind their moment of action. With cross dissolves and careful sizing of figure and landscape, I produce an illusion of continuity and flow, of shifting scenes or backdrops, or of a fractured narrative that allows my digitized body to inhabit an imagined universe. I call this series of videos my acrylic worlds. This is from a series of about oh, 14 pieces that I call my clonal renderings, <laughs> meaning I can replicate myself uh, shot against green screen and then essentially place myself in any landscape. This comes back to that first point. I discovered a new approach to capturing the dancing body in motion. Sound so down here. I've come to call it the Motion Pictures Project. It tells us to keep it up here. Even up the bottom. Freeform abstract action painting style. When I first retired and then during the pandemic, I was my own best subject because it was easy for me, because I was isolated away from others, because I had only myself in my backyard painting studio. More recently, I've been able to film other dancers as my inspirations, but in the beginning, it was only me. And I expect that I'll continue to use my own body as subject as long as I can move. I think of aging artists and their determination and inventiveness to keep making things as long as they possibly can. Old Beethoven, entirely deaf, composing his extraordinary late string quartets. Or the painter Cezanne climbing the hill to his studio or to his lookout point to paint multiple versions of his beloved Mont Saint Victoire. Or the famous photo of Matisse painting from his bed, or Lucian Freud spattered in paint, relentlessly refusing to give up. You can take the sound out here. Back to the motion pictures project. While I'm going solo, I begin by warming up, conditioning, as I have for 53 years. I set up camera and green screen in my studio. I improvise brief sets of movement for camera, either with or without music. I move to laptop to edit the footage using keying effects and project the moving figure floating in its black void on canvas or paper. 
I pick up my wetted paintbrush and enter a direct extension of my dancing body. As my hand follows the eye and brain stem down the spine, shoulder, scapula, arm, wrists, and fingers, the paint takes on its own presence, a web of traces, a kinetic network, a map of motion. Is there anything recognizable left of the actual figure in the body? Is there with any form of dance live or digitally captured? The calligraphy left behind, like that of a Chinese written character or ancient scroll painting, tells of a relationship of body and its space, of noun as verb, of pure action, of a complex system, a dwelling, a message in a bottle, a thumbprint or body scan sent out to the future as a movement ID. Bodies seeking visibility, proof that yes, we were here, even while in isolation, drawn on a digital cave wall to eliminate life at this very dark age. While awaiting return to the dance studio, rehearsal room, and live stage, we dancing bodies learn to see ourselves with new eyes, with a kind of heightened night vision, a trail of sparks in a black void retained on the inner eye. When I received a residency this past August from Ypsilanti's Riverside Art Center to use their lovely dance studio, I imagined extending the motion pictures project to use other dancing bodies as my inspiration. I invited eight professional dancers who embodied a wide range of movement styles to come to the studio one at a time or in duets. I would give them each the same set of assignments or prompts from which to base their movement improvisations. The work created for this project has become the focus of a solo exhibit of my paintings, and I will share with you a five-minute video tour of the gallery exhibit that hopefully illustrates my process and the resulting work. We can bring the sound up again. That is Isaac. consisting of large canvas murals and small paintings on black paper, is a fusion of calligraphy-like brushwork with the motion of dancing bodies, a frieze of seven life-sized standing figures, and a selection of recent portraits offer contrast and a prequel to the motion pictures. I am also making available over 200 works on paper for stills from three videos, Mercy, Men on Mars, and Acapella which are screened on monitors. A montage of short videos demonstrating the process involved in the motion picture series appears on a second monitor. Why motion pictures? A picture of motion is created in the mind's eye every split second as the eye seeks to comprehend what it sees, what catches its attention. As the pioneer filmmakers knew well, bodies in motion attract all attention. And a dancer's motion has been my main attraction for 50 years, both as dancer choreographer and as video artist. With this exhibit of motion pictures, I extend that lifelong practice by casting a twofold gaze onto a dancer improvising against a black void. First, I record the moving figure through my video camera's lens as it instantaneously converts it into digital and easily transposable and accessible data which in turn is cast via projector as a video onto the void of a blank black canvas or paper. My gaze is entirely occupied by the digital trace of this moving figure, partially remembered from watching it first and only unfolding in real time. As the dancer improvised for the camera under my direction just moments ago, as I watch the figure anew, I engage my painter self to join the dancer self. I call into play the action of the paintbrush in my hand, mediated at the junctions of wrist and arm, wired to torso and spine, and activated by the moving image I fixate upon. It is as if my brush is a direct extension of the snake-like undulations, spirals, whiplash curves, and unexpected, artfully displaced rhythms and articulations of my vertebra, all while connected to my spinal cord brain stem and the optics of vision. Follow that seeing spine back through scapula, shoulder, arm, wrists, and into fingers, clasping brush wetted with acrylic paint, 
and my brush hastens to capture via the stroke of the paint an essential thread or indelible trace of the dancer's movement. I hold the brush like a lit sparkler in the darkness and paint the void with traces of its light. What remains is a web, a nest, a cluster of intertwining fibers, ribbons, networks, ganglia, a light dancer, if you will, a picture of motion, a motion picture. My hope is, yes, that each of these paintings imprints its unique kinetic branding of the inner eyelid or a flurry that evokes a fleeting image of a body in motion. Some of its delight, fierceness, lyrical effusiveness, animal alertness, its desire to catch my attention, its ability to draw its elusive pictures in space and time. If every instant of our waking and dreaming were seen with such X-ray calligraphy, would we lift off into weightlessness like the timeless floating calligraphy on an ancient Chinese scroll painting, or gradually plunge deeply into the microscopic neurocircuitry of our eternal moving bodies, grounded forever and yet newly mobilized in light. I'm reminded of a quote from William Goyen's The House of Breath. Who knows what frescoes lie painted on the inside of the skull? Oftentimes I'll set these little studies to music, so I thought I would show you one. To <laughs> This show closed last Sunday, and one of my goals was to, of course, sell as much as I could. The most important and valuable thing I took away from the experience was to have marked a new chapter to my work. As an aspiring painter who started relatively late in the game, I can better see where I've come and where I might want to go next. I recent, recently submitted a proposal for a grant to apply my methodology to an even broader range of body types, ages, abilities, and gender orientations. The hilariously titled Effing Foundation, spelled E-F-F-I-N-G, celebrates sex positivity through the arts and education. How can my paintings reflect such a diversity while also celebrating the shared vitality of all freely moving human bodies? Could it be a unifying catalyst towards building more inclusive, tolerant community? Big dreams for a small project, but that has become a habit over my career. Call it delusional, optimistic, some dream of a utopian democracy of bodies. Which brings me back finally to the Goldberg Suite and the program this weekend. After we see a little bit of Karenna here, who was a former MFA student of mine at the University of Michigan. She now lives in Chicago as a professional dancer. But she, you can see, she really knows how to articulate every centimeter of her body as it's kind of living paintbrush or drawing tool. It's just become so refined. Which brings me back to the Goldberg Suite. The 14 young dancers in the Goldberg Suite represent a kind of democracy of bodies, a collective of individuals who share the same movement language and the space transformed by their formations and their expressive spirits along with the lighting and the divine music of J.S. Bach. The young dancers have taken on the formidable challenge of deciphering my own danced calligraphy that I improvised to Bach's music. They have learned the movement off videos, myself performing each of their parts, almost like handing them a musical score of a choral or chamber work. They have struggled to adapt to a movement sign language that is highly personal, and idiosyncratic. It is a for, like a foreign language relative to much of the classical ballet they have been trained in. But Heather and I have shared the belief that young dancers in the 21st century need to be versatile to pick up a broad array of choreographic styles because that is what the profession now demands. I'm not the only choreographer enamored with the music of Bach. 
Doris Humphrey, Jose Limon, Twyla Tharp, George Balanchine, Jerome Robbins, Mark Morris, Trisha Brown, to name just a few. I think we all share the admiration and fascination with the structural virtuosity, as well as the sheer emotional range in Bach's music. In transposing my movement onto the dancers, I was least certain of imparting to a younger dancer a solo I'd improvised to the longest and most emotion-laden of the variations that I made as a wake or as a tribute to my recently deceased mother. The figure wanders the space in a pair of oversized boots and embodies the lines of the great American poet, Emily Dickinson. After great pain, a formal feeling comes. The nerves sit ceremonious like tombs. The stiff heart questions, was it he that bore and yesterday or centuries before? The feet mechanical go round a wooden way of ground or air or aught, regardless groan, a quartz contentment like a stone. This is the hour of lead, remembered if outlived, as freezing persons recollect the snow, first chill, then stupor, then the letting go. As Heather so eloquently states in the video I'll close with, this sharing or passing on of experience through dance from one generation to the next is perhaps the most important intersection of all. Grayson Jenko, the young man who will perform the solo on Sunday's program, is participating in the essence of our art form. He inherits an embodied legacy that gets passed on from teacher to student, choreographer to dancer, a nonverbal memory map recorded and experienced through the moving body to be shared with multiple generations of audiences for as long as dancers, company directors, and presenters deem the dances worthy of preservation. He dances at an intersection of music, poetry, of digital technology, and of movement, of childhood and adulthood, of fourteen young lives making new memories through the sharing of the collective rituals that dancers perform in rehearsal studios and on stages and screens in Petoskey or Harbor Springs or throughout the world. I'm going to end by viewing a lovely little promotional video that Heather had made. Let me get up the sound. With the Goldberg Suite, I've taken seven of the variations of, of the JS Bach Goldberg variations, set to movement, and we are uh, challenging the dancers not only to delve into a more contemporary mode of moving, but to Remember and retain a lot of the rhythmic intricacies that are that are built into the music. Uh, the work uh, will feature uh, dancers ranging from 11 years old, I think, to 16, uh, solos, quartets, large ensemble for all of the team, uh, and it's been a real delight. It's been a stretch for me because I have not actually worked with a group of dancers since before I retired from the University of Michigan for a dance uh, three years ago. So it's a reminder of the challenges of uh, working with groups, of familiarizing young dancers, not only with my style, but with contemporary or modern dance. Uh, I'm looking forward to returning in November to see the performance of the Harbor Springs High School. Uh, I'll also be giving a lecture at the Country Art Center. And one more excuse to come in the village. It was a new experience for me to learn through a video as opposed to through a person. It, it takes a lot of motivation to do that, just watching the video in your room. <laughs> or wherever you're here saying it, it takes more a lot of motivation to be able to, to do that, but it, it can be rewarding. Peter really helped me refine my movement, especially with the solo, and it, he helped add meaning to it since it was such a personal experience for him. 
I think he wanted to make it more of a personal experience for me and like put me into it. And I think that's really coming along well. And it's begun to flow and it's it's creating a message now. And that is a really great thing we can share that experience. Learning the choreography through a video was definitely challenging because we didn't have the con connection with like being able to ask questions to the teacher or just any kind of conversation. So once Peter was able to be with us for a week, it definitely helped the dancers grow and the dancers being able to connect with each other. And it also allowed us to find purpose in the movement. This past week really let me connect my mind to my movement and allowing that to grow and being that moves, moves, moves my dance. And overall this week has been a really great learning opportunity. Hi, my name is Heather Rowley. I'm the artistic director of Berkeley Tree Art Center School of Ballet. One of the things I love most about dance and being a dancer is the fact that it's a gift. It's one person giving to another person, generation after generation, the history, the richness, the, the pulling of, of information and inner selves out of one another. Um, I'm so grateful and honored that, that Peter has been working with our, our, our dancers, our students, and, and continuing that gift sharing of this generation to our young students. Peter Scarlett will now be indelibly molded into the fabric of the building. All of us are all of each other. So thank you so much for being Peter Scarlett's great effort. Great mind and great work. Thank you. So buy your tickets if you haven't yet. <laughs> That's the end of my presentation. Let's do some Q and A. Maybe we could bring some lights yeah. up. Yeah. I know that was a lot to take in. Uh, I always tell, I always kind of warn the audience, is you're going to have to keep your eyes open and your ears open at the same time. Take it all in. It's a lot. I always have lots of questions, so I'll start us off. And so you guys can think about what you want to ask. Um, one of the things that I, I'm loving watching in your work as it's, both exist physically in a space and also virtually. I, I love the opportunity to see you in multiple dancing on the screen. And then I'm thinking about you translating those movements to these groups of, 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 of dancers you don't know, right? And, and that process is foreign to me. I don't do that in my own creative practice. How much of that do you feel like you're trying to control in, in, the, in the dancer? And how much of that is the dancer bringing to it? Can you just talk about that complexity? I think, I think it's based on a whole set of assumptions that we dancers kind of inherit. It's this idea that, um, that a dancer uh, has a body memory and the capacity to imitate, to look at another body and to take it in and to figure out how it's done and to empathize with the choreographer such that that transfer, transference completes itself. Um, what I am really doing is exploiting digital technology as my memory. In other words, I will improvise for the camera and that records what I believe is my most, most authentic movement and my most spontaneous response to an idea or a piece of music. Then it's up to the dancer. Once I, uh, well, I will, I will then choreograph a dance or group dance in editing by cloning myself and essentially playing all the roles on a screen. And I can figure out the architecture, the basic spacing, the formations, and the counterpoint. Oftentimes, I can play with counterpoint, uh, fugues, canons, et cetera, just using my own body, doing all the roles. 
And if it works, I think it's good. Uh, I can then separate separate each role on its own separate file and pass that file to the dancers. They learn this in two weeks. We're all going to get together and I'm going to look to see what you've learned, and we're going to assemble this in real time and space. It's always a big if. It's scary as hell because I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know if the dancers can pick up what I did. Uh, and I know that it's going to be a, a tough job to uh, translate to the dancers my own individual language of movement. But that, uh, with, uh, I love using imagery. I love speaking. I love giving context and talking about where movement comes from. The moment that, uh, where the dancers really clicked was that I had each of them write their own interpretations of what was happening in a movement sequence. It looked something like this. And, and they would be thinking, what in the hell is he doing? And is, is he a madman? What's that kind of sign language that's going on? And um, they would learn it. And they would find the impulses in their own bodies. And I asked them, would you write for me what you think is happening for yourself? Come up with a scenario that would make sense. And the students came back in a few days with the most exquisite poems of what they were experiencing, and they were all over the map. The, those little poems will actually be on the cover of the program, the Sunday's program. So it's a difficult task, and I'm expecting a lot, but because of the prevalence of digital technology and how dancers, whether young dancers now or dancers from years ago, how we have learned to imitate and pick up movement from any source. We're, we're monkeys, we're imitators. Uh, it works. I mean, knock on wood. So, yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> yes. Um, when you were working with, I believe it was six professional dancers, did they, um, I don't know if you gave them like a, an idea, did they then improvise from the music or have you also given like a Good question. Uh, I gave all of the dancers prompts. For example, improvise for five seconds, for 10, for 30, for a minute. That's the first step. They could do whatever they wanted, use the space however they wanted. Then I was more specific. Can you move from stage right to left, going, making a crossing, and then come back again? Could you move towards the camera and then back away from the camera? Uh, could you? make a set of three brief improvisations, but make a triptych of it, where you do it in three sections, with each section somehow relating to the other. Knowing that in editing, I could put all three of their movements together to make trios of each of them. And so those were the basic assignments, but the rest was up to them. And I, everyone improvised in silence. It was only in editing after the fact so they were all listening to their own inner rhythms. There was nothing dictated to them out of them. Yes. Could you talk about your use of color? Yeah. Multiple colors? Uh, the, uh, I think the large murals you saw in that tour of my recent show uh, shows a proliferation of color. And I would often have on my table a set of colors that, for whatever reason, were kind of exciting. Uh, I, I've become fixated with a kind of a blue, a cyan blue, this gorgeous oxide rust red, uh, almost like a maple in the fall maple tree. Um, and then this silver, uh, iridescent silver, I've kind of grown fond of. Anyways, uh, for these dense, more dense murals, I would project a video of myself moving and I, and I would do multiple takes 
where I would start with yellow. And as, as my figure moved across the canvas, I would be trying to keep up with it and creating these movement impressions. And then I would step back and say, okay, now I'm going to take blue. And I would do the same thing. And what complement what would complement that? Get a depth. And should I put that in the foreground or should I or should I lay it as a background for another color to go in front of? So I would essentially I would improvise with a set of colors that I had nearby. I have never done take color theory. I have I've never done an art class with the course per se, and I, I think I probably should, um, just to kind of increase my range of options. But yeah, that's how I've been doing it. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, having taught film video for many years at the U, I, I always began my course showing the dancers, the artists, the uh, folks taking the class, the origins of film, which were with Edward, Edward Moybridge, who did stop action studies of the human body or animals in motion of the early millions of the, of the European filmmakers and of the photographers who were, were experimenting with kind of this multiple echo effect of, of images in stop action all inhabiting the same uh, frame. Um, so yes, there is definitely uh, this idea of um, trails of, um, of what can be done uh, with the cinematic materials, yeah. Yes. I was growing up watching all Hollywood movies that everybody was just doing the same exact move on the stage. Do your students do choreograph where everybody does the same movement or whatever you do in poker in doing their own interpretation? Well, uh... In the case of the Bach piece that you'll see Sunday, every step of that was preset. I mean, although I improvised the original, the dancers had to learn exactly what I was doing. So, uh, and there are moments on stage where everyone's doing something different. I mean, they learn the movement, they're not improvising. And then there are moments on stage where I have groups of threes and fours in unison, a la Busby Berkeley. Uh, doing the same thing. So you see, similar to a way a choral composer would uh, compose things for soprano, alto, alto uh, tenor, and baritone or bass, you have a choral counterpoint of bodies moving. And this happens on Broadway in, in ballet companies so, or whatever. In the Bach piece, there's also some tongue in cheek stuff happening too where you have a parody of a chord of ballet, which is usually oftentimes in a V and you have multiple women all in the same costume, two, two, doing pretty much the same thing or duets. And then in the center of the V, you have the lead couple doing the pas de deux. And so I've, I've done a take on that. The lead couple in the middle are two fellows trying to vie for our attention. And the, and the women in the core are are trying to upstage the two guys, but they're not really being very successful. So there, there are some plays on those traditional modes of choreography. We have one more question online and then we'll probably wrap. The question is, has your practice of painting with your own movement impacted the way you dance? Our, our question asker is curious if the hand isolation makes you look at the full body movement in a different way. Great question. You know, I can't help but think of the aging process. The fact that I no longer am interested in or really can do grand jetés and leaps and move in large, uh, intense, uh, very involved motions. I, I'm, I'm kind of drawing in, finding uh, the 
finesse in the detail. So uh, painting makes a lot of sense to me that I can focus my body knowledge into something that is much less physically challenged. <laughs> uh, and yes, uh, scale still is important. I find it really satisfying to work large scale on big murals because I can essentially move as large in the painting process as I am moving as a dancer. So I still love doing that. But yes, this calligraphy, you can see this. This, this really strikes me as me. I mean, I, um, I come actually out of the light and our camera sees it better. Yeah, that's perfect. Is that good? <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, it's contained in space. Um, it's very upright, it's somewhat static, but there's an awful lot going on. And I find that rather intriguing. The same way that I find Chinese calligraphy uh, really. Uh, I actually brought a box of these with me. If people are curious and want to look through them afterwards. Uh, so yeah, um, you know, Chinese written character has three different basic styles. One is um, a more formal script where each letter is very autonomous and done in multiple strokes. Then there's the running script, which is more connective. The brush lifts off the page fewer times. And then there's the cursive, which is which is really exciting to me, is that you just keep going. You do multiple characters with one brush stroke, and it becomes much more fluent and easy and improvisational, if you will. So I find uh, ancient Chinese uh, brush ink painting a big inspiration. Again, cross, the crossing of centuries with this idea of movement as the common denominator, as the intersection, which is maybe a good place to end. So, thanks, everyone. Thank and I want to thank our members for making this possible. If you want to see the performance this weekend and don't have your ticket, you can see eight at the front desk. Um, and thanks, Rose and Sos, for making this possible.